So Matt, today we're reviewing the Innovator's Solution by Clayton Christensen, a uh, follow-up to his tremendously successful Innovator's Dilemma, a book we previously reviewed and you didn't really like that much. Hopefully this book changed your mind. Uh, so in the first book, Christensen unveiled a famous theory of disruption, whereby a traditional incumbent, say a Fortune 500 company, is upended by an upstart but it's wielding a technology that the incumbent doesn't usually take seriously until it's too late. Yeah, so the setup of this book is you're a Fortune 500 executive, you've read The Innovator's Dilemma, and you're worried. You know, disruption could come from anywhere, any angle, but good news, Clayton Christensen is here to help you out. He's written The Innovator's Solution, which will help you maybe even disrupt your own business. Yeah, so my notes for this book I had down, but it was essentially the Empire Strikes Back of business books, and it's trying to help Fortune 500 companies kind of regain the upper hand. Uh, like any Star Wars movie, you know, you're going to have seen some of it before. There's quite a bit of rehashing in this book of the first book. Um, in particular, we talk about Christensen's classical model of disruption, whereby disruption really comes from down market to up market. Uh, so to give a tangible example, we can look at something like TVs. Let's say a premium TV, a flat screen costing thousands of dollars. Now that's an up market product. Whereas a portable TV you might find in a college dorm, that's kind of a down market product. And Christensen argues that disruptors uh, or upstarts kind of start down market build a base there, and then move more and more up market to where the profits are, slowly eating more and more of the incumbent's business. Uh, Matt, I know you're itching to critique this theory, so why don't you go ahead? Yeah, you, you said a rehash, but that's putting it lightly. The entirety of Innovator's Dilemma is included in this book, which would be fine other than it's completely wrong. He messes up the entire you know, last 10 years of tech development when he lays out this theory. You can use Tesla as an example. This is a company that started with a very upmarket product. The Roadster basically only appealed to rich Silicon Valley you know, millionaires and billionaires, and then and then suddenly he's now moved all the way down market with the three to capture a much wider audience. So if you're a CEO at Ford, you have been deceived by Clayton Christensen. You were looking for this low-end competitor to put you out of business, but instead, Elon Musk has dropped this ultra-expensive vehicle on you that's taking away your market. Yes, every business theory has counterexamples, right? And this one's no different. Um, and yes, we have seen a lot of times where there has been up market to down market disruption, but Christensen doesn't really consider feasible in this book. But to his credit, I do think he builds out his theory more in Innovator's Solution than he did in Innovator's Dilemma. For example, he talks about how disruption can not only come from down market, but also can come from a separate market altogether. And in fact, when he's advising you know, would-be disruptors, would-be upstarts, he says you really want to compete against non-consumption. You want the customer to either buy your product or not buy anything at all. You don't want them to be choosing between your product, say, and a market leader, because it's just never going to go well. This actually echoes advice we saw from Peter Thiel when we reviewed Zero to One, whereby he advocates going after a very small untapped market and just trying to absolutely monopolize it. Yeah, you know, in theory, I completely agree with this approach, but in practice, I think it is so hard to do. The example that Christensen gives in the book is that you're the CEO of a fast food restaurant and you found out that you're selling lots of milkshakes in the morning. Great problem to have. Mm -hmm. uh, so you go and you look at your demographics and you say, oh, maybe I should make it a little bit sweeter to appeal to this group or a little chunkier for this group. I think, though, you know, when he walks to the example, he says, actually, don't look at any of that. What you should look at is why people are buying milkshake. Why are they hiring the milkshake, to use his vernacular? Uh, and he says that really you should look at the need states, which basically go back to people are buying milkshakes in the morning because they want something interesting to do on the morning commute. They want something that keeps them occupied without creating a big mess. And the milkshake just fits the bill perfectly. And I think, you know... It's great that he can do this, but I think in reality, this is so, so difficult that it's kind of a useless example. Well, actually, uh, since reading this, Matt, I've started a very successful milkshake business um, where I now collect millions of dollars in revenue. So, so thank you, Clayton, for that. Um, one of the things that I would critique about this book, and I'm surprised you have not mentioned yet, is the very post hoc nature of the analysis. So Christensen lays out you know, 30, 40 examples of successful disruptors. Um, Southwest Airlines is one, for example. Um, but all of this analysis is done very much in retrospect, where it is obvious now that a particular company that was once you know, a lowly upstart has become a very successful disruptor. Yes, this was my chief criticism in the innovator's dilemma, which is that you know, a sustaining change is one that helps the existing industry grow, and a disruptive change just completely upends the existing players. And you can't tell any of this until you have you know, some period of time to do this post hoc analysis, and it basically means that all of it is completely arbitrary until you can look at it in the past. And you know, if you were going to believe Clayton Christensen, you should buy companies like RIM and Cisco, but I would argue you would probably be pretty upset with your 10-year returns had you followed his advice. Mm -hmm. But 
Regardless, Adam, I think we should switch gears a bit and talk about the disruptive technology of our day, Bitcoin. What are your thoughts? So if you put Bitcoin into kind of Clayton Christensen's model of disruption, you basically have it going up against an established incumbent in this case, which would be U.S. dollars and you know, the general financial system of the world. Um, in terms of performance attributes, you would say that Bitcoin underperforms in terms of things like transaction speed and you know, having a value that doesn't move by 30% every day. Um, on the other hand, Christensen would potentially argue that Bitcoin is serving an underserved market right now, which would be people who, say, want to launder money. Um, and for that reason, it could grow this underserved market, get better in the other attributes, and eventually maybe overtake, you know, the current incumbent. Yeah, you know, reading through this book, I just felt that Clayton Christensen was perhaps just a bit too soon. Uh, his publishers were too eager to get this book out in 2003, because shortly after, everything changes. And, you know, I think this is one of the traps we fall into, where we look at societal changes versus tech changes, and we didn't actually realize that 1999 to you know, 2003, really the same exact tech. We had large centralized servers, people were on desktop computers, uh, but then shortly after, we have this huge revolution, largely driven by the iPhone and other smartphones phones where now we have mobile devices, now we have cloud computing, and all of the paradigms that are set up in this book just completely fall over in the face of that. And, you know, making a callback to my previous statement, you know, Cisco is now in trouble because all of its architecture is built on this staying the same, and it all changed. And so, you know, this is this is one of those, I think, where, you know, really would have been better served just to wait a couple, couple years. Yes, you mentioned Cisco. You also mentioned previously Rem, um, who research in motion, who built the BlackBerry. And there's a very long extended discussion of the BlackBerry and, the, and Palm Pilots also in this book, where the entire time you're reading it, you're just yelling at him, the iPhone is coming, um, just wait a couple years and everything is going to change. Um, and I think BlackBerry in that position is kind of instructive of, say, the flaws of Clint Christensen's theory. So he lays out this sort of very nice idea that products are either below customer needs or above customer needs. So what I mean is that when you're below customer needs, you're not delivering the performance that a customer would really want. Um, and so now to improve your product, you have to have a very integrated product, all the systems need to be self-contained, and you're really just focusing on maximizing performance. But eventually, you're going to get to a stage where you actually exceed the performance the customer wants. Your product is really too good. Um, and at that time, your product would be modularized, as Christensen would call it, whereby you would basically outsource different bits of the product, um, because the technology is basically stable, it's good enough for the customer's needs, um, and by outsourcing to different suppliers, you're going to be lowering the overall price of the product. Now, Christensen's argument, this has been a long-winded wind-up, is basically to say that BlackBerry was potentially at the point where their product was too good for the market. So he would say that rather than being an integrated product, he would have expected them to become modularized over time, different suppliers making different pieces, and that would kind of bring down the price of a BlackBerry because it was already too good for customers. Now, of course, in retrospect, we know that the iPhone is going to come along, which is going to be so much better than anything BlackBerry can do. But BlackBerry was actually not meeting the needs of the customers fully. But if you're in BlackBerry's position at the time, there's absolutely no way to know where you are on this integration versus modularization spectrum uh, because how do you really know what true customer needs are? Yeah, this is a great example of how the milkshake you know, scenario just completely falls over in reality. You know, I'm sure Rim would have loved to figure out that the real need state of customers was to check Tinder while waiting in line at the airport, but just couldn't figure that out. The customers just weren't telling them that's what they needed. And so, obviously didn't work out for them. But all kidding aside, I think this theory works a little bit better for physical goods than it does for you know things that are a little bit more intellectual or a little bit more you know hard to define. For example, I don't even know how you would apply this to the current state we are in tech, where basically everything's free. You know, your attention is what you're paying to get access to these products, and you know there's no real cost to customers directly paying to use any of them. Right. I think Christensen's theory works well for physical goods, like you said, especially like business to business, like B two B scenarios. Um, and it doesn't work well for this just really weird tech paradigm it has kind of developed. Um, in particular, he gives you some advice that anywhere else would really seem quite sensible. He says, for example, that you need to be impatient for profit, but patient for growth, meaning that when you start a new venture, you should see very early on if it's actually capable of making money and kind of worry about building it out until later. But of course, this you know, runs completely counter to the philosophy of companies like Uber, who are all about growing, growing, growing as fast as you can and getting profits you know, at some far flung point in the future. Yeah, you know, yet another area where Christensen is his whiffed. The theory is not working out as intended. If you look at all of the recent 
you know, VC investment, it's all towards growth. Everybody wants to grow as fast as they can. And then you can look at a company like Amazon, which went 15 years without ever making a profit. It just completely violates every theory in this book. You can even look to their modern development of AWS and sort of leading the cloud computing revolution. And again, this is something that's not predicted. They are one of the largest companies in the world, and yet they're creating an extremely disruptive technology. Christensen says this shouldn't be possible, but yet it happened. To be fair to Christensen, I think if you told someone in the early 2000s that we'd be in 2018 and Amazon still wouldn't really care about making a profit, uh, they would have called you absolutely insane. Uh, so I don't really knock him too much for missing the boat on that one. Uh, but I would say something like Ben Thompson's aggregation theory has kind of become the prevailing wisdom around here of like how tech works, um, rather than Christensen's you know, theories of disruption. Um, switching gears, though, I don't want to spend this entire review bashing the poor man. Um, I think he has written a very tremendous, influential book um, even if some of its you know, theories don't quite hold up today. Um, in particular, I think Christensen actually has good views on hiring. Um, so in the book, he talks about how you shouldn't just hire people for having what he calls the right stuff, or kind of a conventional wisdom of how you know, a salesperson should work, or an analyst should work. Um, you should really focus on as hiring for a specific circumstance where they're going to fill a very particular need for your company. Um, and this, of course, reminds me of something we, we saw in our last book review, of The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz, uh, where Horowitz actually advocates for a very similar principle. Yeah, absolutely. I, I loved the theories in the book that, you know, really you should look for people who have, you know, tried to do something and failed or tried to do something and pivoted because those people got experience. If you look for people who've only had a string of successes and then you try to do a new venture, these are probably not the right people to pick for those roles. And so I thought that was really smart. And I thought the other thing that he talked about a lot was the power of middle management. That oftentimes middle management is the first filtering layer in any company to decide what the company does and doesn't do. And if senior managers are, you know, trying to pick you know different projects and they're they're choosing the ones that they think will lead to the most you know financial growth then this actually leads them down the path of, of peril whereby they kind of ignore all the new changes he also makes a great point I thought about senior management which is that you know senior management oftentimes feels like they have a great view of the business of what's going on but in reality they usually only see what middle management is willing to pass up and pretty soon at any organization middle management becomes really good at tuning the type of projects they're going to present is stuff that they know that senior management will already accept. So, you know, this area of the book, I really liked, thought it was extremely solid. Yes, and I think part of the reason why Christensen has that kind of insight is because he's not just a fierce and ivory talent, as you might once have accused him of being. He's actually run a company himself. He's been a CEO. He's kind of walked the walk. Um, and so I give him a lot of credit for doing that. Well, I noticed that he had to obfuscate the name of the company throughout the entire book until his own self-admission didn't seem to be a great CEO. He just didn't want to draw attention to his success. Uh, I googled the company. They do still exist. They're in some sort of materials manufacturing, and I'm sure it was due to his le leadership. That's kind of surprising, but putting all that aside, we've covered the highlights and the lowlights of this book. But I would wrap it up by saying the first book, the Innovator's Dilemma, really upset me. Uh, I was kind of angry with a lot of the theories put out because I thought they were wrong. This book, Innovator Solution just really disappointed me. It's a rehash of the entire first book. There's nothing new. And, you know, if you came away thinking the first theory was great, well, there's just more of it in this one. <laughs> so I'm definitely a lot higher on these books than you are. Um, I think there's a reason they're considered business classics. Um, I think the theories have kind of been absorbed to such an extent by all these different companies that they just don't seem particularly novel now. Uh, but I think in their day, they're really quite original. Um, one thing I think that's interesting that's happened is that rather than trying to create disruption internally, a lot of companies have moved to more of an acquisition model uh, where they try and find these potential upstart disruptors, acquire them as quickly as possible. Uh, but the principle is still the same of you know, trying to avoid being disrupted. You know, for future segments, uh, we will again return to the topic of disruption uh, by discussing Bitcoin and the blockchain next week. Um, until then, thank you for watching Random Talkers. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube, and we'll see you next time.